Hello, hello. Happy Thursday. Um, I hope um, most of you watched this clip on the uh, on the day of. It'd be probably very disorienting if you're like in a rhythm on YouTube watching these later and you're like, wait, no, it's not Thursday. But no matter what it is, it's Thursday now for this live crew. And today is awesome because we welcome back two people. Um, we're welcoming back now a, a veteran case presenter, Anmol, for her third presentation. Um, before I pass the mic to her, I also wanted to welcome back one of the OGs of the co-discussant seat, um, Dr. Maria Aleman, who is so uh, hard at work being a doctor. She's at clinic right now. She's probably going to get called in <laughs> and look to her left or right during a very busy day at work. But um, those of you who haven't met and met Maria uh, 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 probably are few in number because Maria was literally uh, one of the very few people who defined what it is to be uh, a person or a student in VMR and then later came to define what it's like to be a, an international medical graduate um, in VMR and slowly but surely uh, now has come to define what it means to be a to be CP solvers. Um, Maria works with two other people in the top of the, uh, not dysmia pyramid, but the CP solvers pyramid with Maddie, who you know from VMR and Jack, who you know from VMR. And the three of them run everything that you see that has the CP solvers logo next to it, including uh, the podcast, VMR, um, ever, like anything that has that logo. Uh, Maria has touched, and she's been doing it for a long, long, long time. Uh, she's probably the equivalent of an ultra marathon runner, now approaching three years with CP solvers and almost two years being a leader in CP solvers. And I'll go to tell you that um, we are very, very careful and selective about um, who we bring into the CP solvers fold. I think it's um, very important to us that the... Um, <clears throat> that the ethos of the organization is maintained. So you can only imagine how careful we are um, and what kind of people ascend to the top of the uh, uh, CP Solvers Pyramid. And today we're so lucky to have her um, come join us. She is going into neurology and is applying now. So uh, I hope that Anmol does not have a neurology case. So you get to see how Maria <laughs> How Maria handles challenges and adversity throughout her daily and her CP solvers life. But um, I'll pass the mic to her to say hi and then to Anmol for us to jump into the case. Oh my God, Rami, you said too much. You, everybody here needs to, you know, take everything that Rami said with a grain of salt, but that is the gist a little bit. I've been a part of CP solvers for a while and I'm really thankful for this community. It has helped me grow so much. Um, I, I haven't been as constant with VMR as I would like to be, but I'm happy to be back. Hopefully, uh, and well, it won't have such a difficult case for me, but I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to give it a try. Um, it's always a great learning experience. And it's awesome when you get to do it with amazing people like all of you. So very excited. Thank you, Robbie, for the space. If you ever feel wobbly, just look at Ibrahim's curtains and bask in their beauty and calmness, okay? Uh, but I think Unwall's curtains are also pretty artistic and cool. I feel like today's the, the curtain day. We can hide behind them anytime we want, okay? Unwall, please say hi. Tell us again for the people who haven't met you. This is round three for you presenting. And tell us a little bit about yourself. So a very good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everyone present. And thank you for having me in this virtual morning report. It is actually an honor because I keep coming back because whenever I present, I get to see a new dimension to the case because of you guys. And it's amazing. So uh, thank you so much for having me. And I'm ready. Please let me know when can I begin. Hey. I think you can get started. We're just about to share. I think I made you co-host here, so you should be able to share the whiteboard. And Anmol, you can get going. Uh, okay, so starting with the case, uh, we have a 48-year-old male who came to the emergency with new onset right-sided weakness and high-grade fever. So we have the neurology part, I think. Uh, 
I'm so happy for this. Okay. <laughs> I, well, you never know. Okay. I'll try to, you never know. We won't get biased. Um, Cause I think that is the hardest part when you are so into something that you only see that. Um, but um, I'll, I'll start in a very broad way because um, I think you have to do that kind of approach when you're in the emergency room. Uh, if you don't, you might miss a lot of things. And I think um, even like even being very um, systematic on your approach, always do like ABCs first, because there are some features that will be very striking that will be will pull you away towards like a good evaluation of, um, you know, the the most concerning aspects of a of a presentation. So a weakness is one of those whenever somebody sees weakness. Um, you know, they, they sort of forget everything else <laughs> um, because that it's very, it's very worrisome for the patient and it's very worrisome for um, the people um, taking care of the patient. But I think also you need to be very systematic in making sure that, you know, airway and vital signs are okay and things like that as well. Um, I think it's interesting, the right-sided weakness, uh, always when we see weakness, it's very... I think it's always important when you see a neurological symptom to figure out the time course, but especially with weakness, especially when it's one-sided because um, you definitely are concerned about vascular um, causes, um, mainly stroke. Um, so, and that is, you know, the treatment for it is time dependent. So you want to make sure that if it's hyper acute that you're, you know, using that algorithm. Um, but it, it would be it would be interesting to think about stroke first in a patient that's 48 because it, it, it's, he's fairly young. Um, so not usually thinking about like the cardiovascular um, risk factors that we normally see in older adults. And the one thing that is very worrisome is fever because that is something that I, it, it's not as frequent to see in, you know, like in the, in the bucket that I'm like trying to not dive into, but I've already <laughs> like I missed and I dove into because when I was thinking about weakness, I couldn't help but think about, you know, strokes, but the fever really pulls me away from it. Um, so I think, you know, with fever, you are definitely have an inflammatory picture. And when you get that with any neurological symptom, you have to be very concerned about possible CNS causes of fever. Um, meningitis and cephalitis that can be um, complicated with um, seizures or strokes. Um, but I think fever definitely makes it me think, but well, with the neurological causes about CNS infections, but also all sorts of other systemic infections that can, um, that can, you know, present this way. So I think I'm mostly concerned about time course. I think that would be my main question for the history. Um, and I'm sure Animal will, will give us a lot about that. Also think about, um, you know, other, um, other associated symptoms. So think about all of the possible, you know, infections that can be presenting this way. So thinking about, you know, pulmonary symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, other neurological symptoms, and then thinking a lot about risk factors because 48, definitely not, you know, your typical cardiovascular risk factors, but, you know, any sort of exposures, any sort of immunodeficiencies. Um, where, where is the patient from as well, I think is gonna help us. But right now, I don't think I can narrow it down other than I'm very concerned about this patient. Um, yeah, what do you think, Robbie? Oh, I think you're muted, Robbie. It's probably a good thing that I was muted because I was talking about gnar and smells, which have no relevance to this case. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right. There's something a little unusual here. And my advice to you all, all now is you can't be thinking of the answer to this problem. You're all really having to clarify the nature of it. And just think about what, what we're simulating in this case. You're simulating that you walk into a room and a patient says, hello, doctor, I have right-sided weakness and a fever. That doesn't happen. There is no way that a patient walks in and says those things. 
there's always context clues um, that um, the patient will provide. And so what all that you can really tell here is that this is very unusual. And it's the unusual nature is the combination of a patient being having weakness on their right side and still having the desire to project to you that they're febrile, right? That's an interesting combination. Like imagine Maria, if God forbid, I were to get right side of weakness right now and I went to a doctor, I probably would ignore the fever, right? So why is the fever being mentioned as a very powerful clue? And it tells you what the time course is. This is not acute. There's no way that this started suddenly where you have an abrupt onset fever and an abrupt onset right-sided weakness. So the time course here is certainly not hyperacute. And then if it were chronic, the patients with chronic fever don't get right-sided weakness, they get global weakness. So you can infer just from the combination of the two symptoms that their only way they're not anaphylactic to each other. And the only way they merge is that the patient has an acute or subacute time course. And so the fact that it's unusual um, and the fact that these two things don't really fit well with each other tells you a little bit. You can start to predict the time course. And I think you have to be a little bit careful that the um, source of the weakness may not be neurologic, in large part because inflammation in the neuraxis is so rare, as you pointed out, that part of me is wondering whether the patient has an osteoarticular or, or muscular cause of weakness. Do they have a septic arthritis in their elbow? And that's why they're weak. Um, so on and so forth. So um, I completely agree with you. We need a lot more information here. The reason we need a lot more information is that it would be very, very unusual for a patient to lead with these two things. Um, and so you're going to have to figure out like what, what is the narrative in the sequence of events? But looking at this right now, the time course almost certainly has to be subacute. And so we can start to uh, assume that until uh, proven otherwise. All right. And well, tell us more, please. Okay, so uh, to, talking about the history of present illness, this ca patient came to the emergency with altered mental status and right-sided upper and lower extremity weakness. He was disoriented and confused. He presented with loss of speech along with high-grade fever and profuse sweating. He had fever off and on for two weeks prior to that with thrombocytopenia and transaminitis. 15 days back, when he developed fever with chills, he was provisionally diagnosed as dengue. Minimum platelet count that time was 20,000, which recovered gradually, and he was discharged from the local hospital. And then suddenly today, the patient presented with these symptoms. And there is no history of similar complaints in the past. Uh, talking about the past medical history, there is no known past significant medical or surgical history, and the patient is not on any regular medications. There is no significant related family history, and he comes from a village in northwest India that is in a, from a rural setting. Okay. This is such a case, Animal. Thank you for bringing it. Um, like, I can't wait to keep hearing more about it. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, it, it was interesting what Robbie said that how, you know, fever, weakness, they don't usually come in together. And I think we were, I was trying at the beginning to um, merge this into one unified diagnosis. But I think, you know, that that was like possibly a mistake that I did at the beginning because it, you know, as Robbie said, it is so infrequent that I think somehow, you know, we had to take away one and focus on, you know, the other. And I think in this case, we can definitely focus on, um, I think the fever has, is sort of, um, you know, diagnosed and because it's been a longer course, there's been more exams doing all of that. And I think, um, I think the dengue uh, diagnosis is, you know, fits the picture, but specifically, you know, with dengue, you need to be very careful that you need to figure out what type of dengue is the person having, because dengue can go from anything from being like feeling, you know, myalgias and arthralgias all the way to having, you know, 
severe shock from bleeding and, you know, vascular leak. Um, and it's the same disease, right? But it's not the same presentation. So I think that it was really important that he doesn't only have dengue, but he has, you know, severe dengue. And so dengue was like possibly, you know, even before the, this presentation with the neurological symptoms, he was at, at a very high risk of different complications. Most importantly, I think brain hemorrhage. Um, so I think it's, it's, that was important to, you know, determine the risk of the patients of complicated dengue. Um, we see that the, the neurological picture is um, mostly uh, acute or hyperacute. So he comes with um, weakness, altered mental status that I, I don't know if it was progressive, but with the acuteness, I think I'm very concerned about um, hemorrhagic stroke especially because of the, the, the background that he's presenting with. So I think um, one of, you know, it's very hard to distinguish between ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, but one of the key factors that presents with hemorrhagic stroke that is not as typical in ischemic stroke is an altered mental status. Uh, so if you find a patient that's slide down and you're concerned about a possible stroke, especially when they're younger, hypertensive, or they have this sort of a bleeding risk, um, definitely hemorrhagic stroke. And then I also think that, you know, as certain diseases travel together, arboviruses, they definitely travel with a bunch other uh, risk of other diseases, like, like um, mosquito-borne diseases. So I'm not, I'm not as familiar with like cerebral dengue. Like I'm not sure if this can be like meningitis or encephalitis from it because we have two out of the, we have, we have two out of the three things that you look for in like a triad for meningitis. We have the fever, we have the altered mental status. I'm concerned about vascular causes, but it can be like the inflammation itself, uh, which can be the underlying factor. So very, very concerned. And then, you know, for, cerebral dengue, cerebral malaria, um, and other, you know, infectious diseases um, that can present in this setting. Um, so definitely we'll be in the lookout for some imaging. <laughs> I think that's what I want right now, but um, Ravi, what, what are you thinking? Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think that, you know, it's amazing how the combination of right-sided weakness and altered mental status essentially localizes the lesion to the brain. And I think that hyperacuity supports a vascular cause and hyperacute focal symptoms is very much an ischemic stroke, but hyper, hyperacute focal symptoms with encephalopathy prioritizes a hemorrhage, which is a concern that you might already have alone from the fact that the platelet count is already low. Um, of course, I think that what can happen as a result of an ischemic uh, issue causing altered mental status is multifocal emboli. So another possibility here is a patient has a shower of uh, clots, be it embolic or diffuse thrombotic, and has a severe uh, disproportionate clot in the left, uh, uh, um, uh, left brain, but has a shower of emboli causing their encephalopathy. I completely agree with you. I think the two threads we have to follow are there's a brain problem here for sure, and there's a platelet problem. The platelet problem was presumed to be dengue because it was associated with fever. So I think we'll have to follow those two threads. There's a brain problem without doubt. There's a platelet problem and there's a fever problem. And how those play out is going to be very, very uh, intriguing. But I think this person, you apply your code stroke uh, um, uh, kind of philosophy, which is you need to know what the last known normal was. You need to know what the blood pressure is. You need to know what the glucose is, and then you need to take the patient rapidly um, to, the, uh, to the CT scanner if possible. So last known normal, glucose, blood pressure, uh, and CT scan. Uh, all right, and we'll tell us more, please. Just wanted to clarify that uh, in the previous course of the hospital, the lowest count was 20,000, and it recovered when the patient was discharged. So now the patient is having normal platelet count. And uh, talking about the vital signs, uh, at the time of presentation, the blood pressure of the patient was 100 by 60. And heart rate was tachycardic, 127 breath beats per minute. And the patient was tachypneic as well, 28 breaths per minute. The saturation was 92% on room air. And he was febrile with 40.22 degrees Celsius or 104.4 degree Fahrenheit. 
talking about the general examination, uh, he was toxic, appearing, disoriented, and not responding to commands. And the examination was limited because of the patient's agitation. So uh, the H-E-E-N-T was, uh, pupils were normal, bilaterally equal in size and reacting. The cardiovascular and pulmonary examination was unremarkable at that time. The abdomen was distended with hepatomegaly. Uh, the neuro examination was uh, GCS was E3, V1, and M5. Talking about the extremities, power of the right upper extremity was one, one by five, and right lower extremity was two by five. And uh, regarding the skin findings, there were hyperpigmented uh, lesions noted on the uh, fingers near the nail bed and on the hands. So should I give you some initial labs in the salicor? Oh my gosh. I think you can't take a neurological assessment away from a neurologist with this incredible exam. So why don't we stop here? But uh, well, I think you, this presentation is top notch. You have us on the edge of our seats and you're getting us such clear sequential data to study. And I also appreciate you clarifying that the platelet count was an issue of the past, um, potentially a clue to what's going on, but it's no longer an active issue. That's very, very helpful. All right, Maria, what do you think of this neuro exam? Let's focus on that first, then we can talk about the other stuff, just to get a smile on your face first. No, I was going to do it. Okay, well, neuro first then. Um, so I think we were all, we were concerned about hemorrhagic um, strokes. And I think when you see that, you definitely need to like reflexive see vital signs, pupils, um, those two first. Why? Because then the, you can sort of assess your risk of like immediate herniation, which is old, like even more worrisome. Um, so I think with um, with like the, that normal or like low B, sort of low BP and pupils being reactive and isochoric, I think that now I am a little bit less worried about it. The patient is like disoriented and responsive to commands, GCS, we six. I'm really bad at math. But nine. We, okay, nine. <laughs> okay. Um, and one thing that I, I've learned uh, is that sometimes when we see a GCS, we if if there if you ever if at any time you see a GCS that it's not 15, then you can you can't really assess for the weakness pattern. So um I think that that's something that I was doing wrong um, before I had more experience with neuro. But if the patient is not fully cooperative, you can't really use a scale from one to five. You just really need to describe what they can do. Like if, if the arm drops and I think you can do, uh, or like if he is able to move independently, um, but he definitely has um, both, right? Like, I'm not sure, animal, maybe you can't, um, I, I think I might've missed it, but he, that, is he having like right and left-sided weakness? Oh, no, uh, he's just having right sided weakness. Left side is fine. Nice. Perfect. So he that the that the other part is that you definitely need to try to localize the, the lesions, right? Not you don't need to do it with like a numerical scale, but you can definitely notice when the patient, you know, has weakness from one arm with certain maneuvers, and then definitely you want to see the, the tonicity and the reflexes to figure out if it's it's maybe his baseline or something um, more chronic, but this seems very acute in that, that sense, the weakness. Um, so I think it, it, it's still very, you know, it goes along the lines of what we were thinking that he might be having uh, vascular problems on the left side of his brain, but it's not as concerning because he doesn't seem to be herniating right at the, at the moment. I'd love to check for like neck rigidity, um, or you know more of the chronic signs of meningitis um, to because that is also something that I'm concerned with dengue or other arboviruses or you know parasites that can cause um, meningoencephalitis, and I think that is what my main worry on the neuro side. On the other part, I think it's also worrisome that his you know his saturation is down and his heart um, his breathing rate is elevated, and I don't think at the beginning we were quite concerned about a possible, um, you know, pulmonary problem, but in the setting of dengue, I'd be 
concerned about, uh, you know, pulmonary edema. So, but he doesn't have any crackles or anything like that. But I don't think, um, I don't think I'm, I feel as safe with the patient and his pulmonary status right now. The abdomen being distended with hepatomegaly, you know, that can also be secondary to dengue or other parasites. Or even, you know, like maybe not even in like the infectious bucket, but more on, no, I think I'm going to stick with the infectious bucket because I think, you know, we have like a very strong infectious picture here with the high grade fever, the risks and, um, you know, the, the course that he's been having that seems um, very subacute and progressively worsening. Um, so I, I, I don't think I can pull away from this being infectious in nature, I, I would, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't think otherwise. Um, but yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Robbie? I have nothing to add to your thinking. And I'll just supplement the conversation by adding a practical sense, which is whenever you see this presentation, you should assume this is a serious brain infection until proven otherwise. And there's um, nothing for me to add to Maria's argument for that. But the question is, what do you do now? And I think that, um, uh, if you assume that there's a bacterial process driving this, which is not foolproof, the first thing to do is to kill out blood cultures right away. The yield of blood cultures in a systemic febrile syndrome like this it, it, going to the brain is 50%. And then you probably almost certainly have to give all these things, vancomycin, ceftriaxone, all this is targeting the fact that uh, this patient might have bacterial meningitis or a, a serious bacterial infection. When do you need to CT a patient? This patient definitely needs a CT because he has fo a focal exam. And then you do a lumbar puncture and then you reassess the treatment based on that data. So you have to be very, very tight in your management of this patient here. Blood cultures, empiric antibiotics, probably also fluids, and a CT before you do a lumbar puncture. Now, that's the reflexes step that you have that you take in this patient. And I think you should assume, okay, while you do that reflexively, blood cultures, empiric treatment, including steroids, probably, uh, you may ask, okay, well, what's going on here? And Maria, I think you're absolutely right. We should presume this is an infection and this infection has taken up shop in the brain. The focality of the disease process tells us there's a very likelihood that the inflammation is in the brain. A fever plus diffuse encephalopathy often means that the, the source of inflammation is everywhere else and the brain is just going down as part of that systemic process. So where in the brain can the infection be? And there are four, fundamentally four different compartments in the brain. Is it the parenchyma? in the form of a focal infection, like an abscess, or a diffuse infection, like an encephalitis? Is it in the ventricles, causing ventriculitis? Is it in the vessels, causing a infectious uh, a vascular cause, like endocarditis? Or is it, in the, is it in the meninges? So parenchyma, ventricles, vessels, and meninges. You might say, wait, hold on, how do... It's intuitive to see how parenchymal issues can cause focality. It's intuitive to see how a vascular issue can cause focality. You might wonder, well, how can a meningeal process cause focality? Mm -hmm. And the number one cause of um, strokes in patients with meningitis mm -hmm. is that the meningeal inflammation extends to irritate the blood vessels, causing a vasculitis. And that vasculitis, infectious vasculitis, can cause strokes. It's most commonly described with strep pneumomeningitis, but also can occur with syphilis, occur with TB, and occur with fungal infection. So this patient can have an infectious process in any one of the four compartments, the parenchyma, for which imaging will be helpful, the vessels, which is an interesting hypothesis based on the nail findings of possible embolic phenomena, the ventricles, which are unlikely here to be the sole cause, but the meninges are also on the hook because you can get a men meningitis with a secondary infectious vasculitis causing a stroke-like syndrome. But practically speaking, blood cultures, vancomycin, ceftriaxone, plus minus ampicillin or acyclovir, probably steroids, um, and then a CT scan because the patient has focal findings and then a lumbar puncture, along with the systemic evaluation. That's sort of like your bacterial meningitis reflex, which this patient, unfortunately, has probably triggered. Okay, and well, tell us more. Okay, um, so talking about the labs, uh, HB is 14, and TLC is 19,150, with a neutrophilic predominance, neutrophils being 85%. And platelets were 2,22,000. 
then uh, serum electrolytes uh, were slightly deranged. Uh, sodium was 132. Potassium was 5.12. Chloride was 94. Calcium was slightly low at 8. Phosphorus was 2.8. So the se total serum bilirubin was normal at 1. Uh, AST was 203. And at the time of presentation, and in fact, during the course of hospital, the maximum value it reached was 676. ALT was 163, and the maximum value it reached was 556. Serum total protein was 6.2. Serum albumin was 2.4, and globulin was 3.8. GGT was 133. Alkaline phosphatase was 186. Then triglycerides were 341. Total cholesterol was 105, HDL being 13. Viral markers, HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C were done and the patient was non-reactive. Serum uric acid was normal, HbA1c was normal and the patient's RBS was also normal. BUN 21, normal, creatinine 1.65, again normal. And the urine routine at the time of presentation was normal, except uh, for the presence of trace proteinuria. And urine culture was done, which came out to be negative. So uh, LDH value was 627. And the maximum it reached during the course of the hospital was 800. Procalcitonin was 2.38, CRP was 104, Dengue NS1 antigen was negative, IgG antibodies negative, and IgM antibodies were positive. Ammonia was 79.4, and blood culture was taken from three different sites, which turned out to be negative. That's... Uh, the end of the laboratory examination. I'm so worried. <laughs> um, hmm. Let me think about what we have, because I think um, it's hard to, I think it's, it's hard to narrow down like, well, no, no, that's not true. I think I'm most concerned about all of the neurological findings but we can also see that this, um, he has severe disease in other organs as well, you know? So he, he definitely has um, problems in like the, like the heme system with a thrombocytopenia. He has uh, some sort of liver injury that is not as concerning, but it's there. He has, um, I think he had proteinuria. So he, he, he creatinine, I think it, it was, normal maybe but I think we can also think maybe he has like a renal problem um I was a bit concerned when I saw like the like the the, the, the potassium thinking maybe this was gonna be some sort of like adrenal insufficiency caused by infectious causes um and I think we have the dengue that could explain everything I think it's still in like the timing of concern for dengue but I think it would be, um, it would definitely be a mistake just to assume this is dengue um, because when there's one infection, you can have many different infections. I'm, I'm at least a little bit less concerned with uh, his HIV being negative because then we can lower in our differential some space occupying diseases that can present with the focal weakness. Um, as Robbie said, like parenchymas, neurological infection. So I, I think we can lower in the diagnosis like cryptococcus, toxoplasmosis, histoplasma, like tuberculomas. But I think um, the same way, I don't, I, I don't, I think we need more testing, more infectious testing because, and with like the blood cultures being negative, I think we, this, is, this is definitely sounds not just like your normal, typical bacterial um infection. So I, I'd be concerned for, you know, testing for more um, parasites and like blood smears, um, also testing for other types of viruses. 
uh, that can cause meningoencephalitis and even possibly some fungi that could cause all of that. I think that would be less in my differential with the HIV being negative. Um, but I, I, be, I think the most concerning for me right now would be malaria. Um, and so I'm definitely looking for a blood smear now. Um, Robbie, help. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, Maria, I think the, the, the truth is this is actually very tricky aliquot to analyze right now, in large part because the core problem is, seems to be centered around the brain and we have no idea what's going on there. So it's really hard to be able to be like, well, how do I understand this data? Because the data is out of the context of clarity on what the core problem is. But I think you do have a prominent signature that the body is reacting very strongly to what's happening in the brain. And I, I think it tells you really that this is a systemic disease with brain involvement rather than an isolated brain disease. So for me, I think the fact that there's neutrophilic involvement really argues against a viral process in general, though there are some exceptions to that. So that's the progress I think you can confidently make. Every Everything else, including the LDH, um, is a little bit tricky to analyze now. If we get a vascular imprint in the brain, for example, then you might say, wait, hold on, this person has fever, vascular involvement in the brain and has a super high LDH. Is there some sort of hematological issue? But if you get a brain abscess, then you're like, huh, I don't know if I can connect that well to an LDH. So for me, I think I just take this to be like the body's reacting very strongly to this way in a neutrophilic pattern. The LDH is a loose end. We'll see if we can connect that. But I think you need to understand, this is a great aliquot and it allows us to reflect on how data out of context is very hard to put and analyze. Once we know what the problem is in the central nervous system, we can come back to this. And I think you'll see how much easier it will be to make progress on it than to get it and be like, hmm, okay, one hour later, we have these labs. But oh, gosh, what are we trying to help? What are we trying to use them for? And I think the brain problem will be really, really uh, illuminating. All right, and well, tell us more, please. Okay, uh, so let's talk about the imaging. MRI brain was done and it showed large acute infarct in left medial occipital lobe and left parieto occipital lobe. There was moderate size acute infarct seen in left thalamus, multiple acute uh, lacunar infarcts in corona radiata of bilateral frontoparietal lobes and left cerebellar hemisphere and there was no evidence of hemorrhage seen. So we had infarcts, but no evidence of any hemorrhage. Then uh, carotid and cerebral artery CT angiography was done, uh, which showed near complete occlusion in distal P2 segment of left posterior cerebral artery. And there was no significant atherosclerotic disease or stenosis noted anywhere in the other arteries, uh, namely internal carotid, vertebral, or cerebral arteries. So this is about the first two imaging. Uh, should I proceed on to other imaging as well? Oh, I think this is great. Oh, wow, what an incredible, incredible MRI result you've given us here. Thank you. Oh, so Maria, what are you thinking? Hmm. So... I think, um, you know, from the first thought, like the, the HPI, I think we were concerned about vascular causes because of the hyperacute nature of it. I think this MRI is impressive because of just the extent of different areas being affected that we weren't, um, that, you know, wasn't obvious from the exam, especially with the altered mental status. So I think I heard like, cerebellum and um, brainstem or I, I, I or and like left parietal occipital a, a bunch of everything so I think um you know that that definitely makes me worried about embolic causes and I think we need to study you know the the heart see um mainly if that's the origin of the emboli but I also worry that you know we do have a complete occlusion, but because of what we were mentioning about different infections causing, you know, meningitis and then vasculitis, I think we, I'm also concerned that it may be a problem of the vessel itself. And I would like to see, you know, um, more MRIs with contrast 
um, to see if there's any inflammation in the meninges and in the vessels. I am not confident saying this is like purely embolic and we can rule out like a vascular cause secondary to a meningitis. Um, I might have missed the, the meninges descriptions with contrast, but I think for now I'm worried about those two things. So I, I, I think I would, I would get more imaging with contrast because we would like to check for the inflammation and then um, more studies for it from the heart. I'm not, what do you think? Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think whenever you have a thrombus somewhere, you have to always answer two questions. The first, I think, which is our reflex is, where did this thrombus come from? Is it a local thrombus that right there from maybe atherosclerosis? Or is the thrombus coming from somewhere else like the heart? So where is the first question I think we're very good at asking. The question that we don't have to ask explicitly as often, but is important in an unusual case is, well, what is the nature of the material that is occluding the blood vessel? In most circumstances, it's regular old thrombus, bland thrombus, but it can be pus like endocarditis. It can actually be tumor like a myxoma flicking off. It can be calcium, like in an aortic stenotic valve that's flicking off stuff. Um, it can be cholesterol and cholesterol emboli. It can be bile. It can be amniotic fluid. It can be IVC filters. It can be so many things. And I think the reason to, to ask what here is because the patient has a fever, right? And so is it regular old bland thrombus? Is it pus or is it tumor? And I think all those things are really, really important. To, to help us understand um, what the nature of the material is. But we also, like you said, Maria, have to figure out, well, where did it come from? And you're seeing a shower of, um, of ischemic events. And whenever you have multiple simultaneous thrombosis, there's only really one of two possibilities. Either you have a central clot in a very bad location, like on the aortic valve, or you don't have an issue in a bad location. You have a very, very bad condition that causes you to clot everywhere, like a vasculitis or a vasculopathy or a super hypercoagulable condition like APLS. So multiple simultaneous thromboses equals bad location, like endocarditis, or a really bad condition that just unleashes clot devastation everywhere. And I think the practical analysis to this case is to exclude or analyze one dimension. What's going on in the central apparatus? Is this a bad location? Is there a clot there? And that can help us figure out which category we're in. Are we in the bad location category or are we in the bad condition category? And at the same time, we'll probably accumulate more data to help us figure out, is just this bland, is it bland clot or is it pus or cancer? So those are, I think, the two active questions now that the case is crystallized to. Is this a bad location or a bad condition? And what is the nature of this material? I'll give the mic to you, Anmol, for more information. I just want to say, Animal has been smiling the whole time we've been discussing. I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign that we're just so far away from it. <laughs> um, but I'd love to see her smile on camera. No, but I'm so amazed by your discussions as always, because as I said, it gives a new dimension to the case. And I'm actually learning so much from you guys. All the differentials are coming up yet again. So uh, let's continue the case. Uh, so during the course of the hospital, the patient developed respiratory distress and had to uh, had re uh, required NIV support. So a uh, chest CT was with contrast was done, which showed moderate to severe pericardial effusion noted with enhancement and mild bilateral pleural effusion was noted. So collapse of both lower lobes noted, left greater than right, and no evidence of nodular or mass lesion was seen and no significant mediastinal lymphadenopathy was seen. So there were multiple hypodense, hypoenhancing areas seen in the splenic parenchyma, which represented splenic infarcts and hypodensity seen in the upper pole of the left kidney 
suggestive of focal nephritis. So uh, for the pericardial effusion, pericardiosynthesis was done and pericardial fluid was analyzed, which was slightly hazy, dark yellow colored fluid. And adenosine deaminase was 101. Glucose was low at 17.5. LDH was raised 5,506. Proteins were 5.2 indicating exudative nature. TLC was 450 with 80% neutrophils and cytology for malignant cells and acid fast bacilli was negative with presence of inflammatory cells appreciated. After which ultrasound abdomen was done, which showed liver was prominent in size, measuring approximately 15.6 centimeter. Gallbladder was seen in distended state with intraluminal haze and no pericholecystic fluid was seen. Uh, pancreas was normal and spleen was enlarged in size approximately 13.7 centimeter with heterogeneously hypoechoic area. Then bilateral pleural effusion and pericardial thickening was noted. Yes. Your heart. <laughs> I love that. Yes. <laughs> like mic drop. Um, um this is hard. This is hard. He has um a little bit of bad stuff happening everywhere. Um so I think at the beginning when we were just mentioning, just so like I'm super clear with my my thought process, when you were just mentioning, you know, like the pericardial infusion, I kept thinking, you know, like um I'm thinking. <laughs> because, you know, it, it has a problem with with platelets, yes, but it has also like problems with like the glycocalyx and you know the the vasculature leak. And I think that's also seen with like cerebral uh, like with a severe dengue. But I don't. I think it we it it has passed the threshold of of you know bad things that we can attribute to it, and with you know widespread disease just everywhere, um, you definitely can't help but you know to say this is vascular in nature, right? Um, and I think it can be as as Robbie mentioned a problem from with the vessels itself or a problem in um like um in you know like a source of different thrombi, but I think I, I am I, I I think this is more vascular in nature because I think we are also seeing other problems that are not embolic itself, like the pericardial effusion that I it speaks more about you know the the leaking in the vascular itself other than the thrombi. So I think you know curtains right it's always vasculitis, but then what's the cause of the vasculitis, right? And I think I'm still concern about infectious um, etiologies of vasculitis because of the, um, the background that we had, you know, this was a healthy patient that didn't have any, you know, past medical history or different events to come to that, you know, would, would orient me towards a, you know, familial disease or, um, you know, autoimmune process. Um, so I, I still think this is infection. And then what types of infections can cause, you know, vascular problems? I think the big ones that in my head are, you know, TB, um, syphilis, and some uh, and like different types of fungi, like histoplasmosis. Um, and I think what really stood out was the ADA, like the pericardial fluid uh, with the ADA and low glucose. Um, I, I think you said, um, I'm not sure, but I, I don't know if you did like cultures for TB or other tests for TB. Um, but I, I think that's where my my head like is going towards, you know, different causes of, there's like a really cool word for infections that target the vessels. And I have no idea what's the word, but I know it's really cool. Somebody will put it in the chat probably, but definitely, you know, wanting more TB tests done, um, syphilis and maybe uh, fungi, you know, markers. Um, yeah. 
Oh my gosh, Maria, can you imagine? I can't imagine how many people will be working on this case in real life. And I'm so grateful, Emily, that you brought it here. It's a very complicated case. Every single organ is not working. There's no organ that's working, nothing. And But there's a theme here, and the theme is that all the organs are affected in a vascular way. There's splenic infarcts, there's renal infarcts, there's finger infarcts, and there's brain infarcts. So while this seems like this is a systemic disease, we're still back to that same thing. Is this a bad condition causing thrombosis everywhere, or is there a central location in the heart itself that is showering the rest of the body with disease? And I think we haven't really made tremendous progress on whether this is a bad condition or a bad location because we haven't analyzed um, the valves and the heart itself with an echocardiogram, and that'll be very, very crucial. But I think you might ask, well, what does the pericardial analysis here? And this is a, a exudative pericardial effusion in a patient who has been pan scanned and does not have cancer. And so you should worry that this is a uh, infectious pericardial process. And that's where the uh, cell count is really helpful. This is not neutrophilic predominant uh, pericardial effusion suggested on TV. This is neutrophil predominance. And so if you have an inflammatory pericardial effusion without evidence of malignancy in the body, the patient's been scanned from head to toe with the abdomen and chest. And so you should worry about there being a purulent pericarditis from an acute bacterial infection, most commonly staph aureus, but also strep pneumo and occasionally some gram negatives. So here the big tension is how do I reconcile purulent pericarditis with the fact that the blood cultures are negative? And we have to remember that blood cultures are not perfect. So for me, I am now in a situation where I am ignoring the blood culture results and saying this person has neutrophilic purulent pericarditis and has emboli everywhere. I'm really, really worried about the possibility of regular pyogenic bacterial um, endocarditis. And maybe the patient got one dose of antibiotic before he got the blood cultures drawn, and that's why they're negative. So the next key test is going to be an echocardiogram. And I'll try to simplify this case. We had a patient who had fever and had a had, had a, a vas had a fever and a vascular phenomenon, um, and um, and we've now learned that the patient has multiple embolic phenomenon everywhere, and we're trying to figure out actively is this person having a diffuse thrombotic condition, or does this person simply have an elegant explanation by having a bad uh, accumulation of material in a central location like their heart? That's the key question. We're making more and more progress on the what by finding so much inflammation that it's much more likely that this person has pus occluding their blood vessels rather than bland thrombus. And I think the key test here is the nature, the neutrophilic predominant pericardial effusion, reinforcing the notion that we should think about bacteria and less commonly fungi. Are there some fung fungi that can do this? Yeah, for sure. Candida can do this, which can show up on blood cultures only 30% of the time. Aspergillus can do this and mucor can do this. The latter, aspergillus and mucor, usually come from the lungs and there's no evidence of any lung issue here. So for me, I think this patient is in dire need of an echocardiogram and I really worry about the possibility of an endovascular process. Um, yeah. Tricky, tricky, tricky case. Uh, I fear or worry a lot for the patient. This is not looking good, but um, yeah, we'll see what Anmol has in store for us. Uh, so now we're moving over, first of all, amazing, amazing discussion. Thank you so much for that. And now we're moving towards our last aliquot, which will reveal the diagnosis for this patient. Uh, so again, as you said, 2D echo was done which showed small vegetation to anterior mitral leaflet with normal ven uh, left ventricular ejection fraction and no regional wall motion abnormality. Mild MR and mild pericardial effusion was noted. And as we said that the patient blood culture was negative. So the patient was diagnosed as a case of culture negative infective endocarditis with septic emboli to brain and spleen. Wow, I, I I have so much to reflect here. I'm curious, Maria, what are you thinking? Oh my God, so many thoughts. Like I really need to um to reflect on this as well. Uh, it the heart, you know, is so tricky. It it can affect everything. 
And so suddenly um, that I that yeah, I think I think we I I don't know. I I don't know. Like it it still amazes me the the severity of what um you know a vegetation can cause everywhere. Um I I wonder, you know, how you know if if there was anything that predisposed um it to start happening was it chronic you know what changed did dengue had anything to do with it at all or not um you know um so yeah i don't know i'm i'm perplexed how are you feeling robbie yeah i think you should be because most of these cases you have devastating thrombi everywhere and your blood cultures are positive and I think if we had heard the blood cultures are positive, it would be pretty uh, linear to the answer. But I think, you know, um, as a future neurologist, your nemesis will be the heart as it causes much devastation to your patients. And I think whenever you have multiple embolic phenomenon, it's almost always the heart, um, especially when, and when there's no atrial fibrillation to put on the hook, it's usually an endovascular problem. And yeah, I think the tension in this case is what causes the culture negativity. And the truth is that, um, that the most common cause of culture negative endocarditis is the patient has a culture positive disease and got some antibiotics. That's the most common cause. And having um, lived in many, uh, having lived in this general region of the world, I know the access to antibiotics is very, very low. Um, so that would be our leading thing. But I'm, I'm curious, Anmol, how, how did you manage this case without knowing what the underlying um, cause was? Or did you ever figure out or have a hypothesis as to what the cause was? Uh, yes. So basically, uh, till date, we don't know what the predisposing thing was for this person. But uh, we followed the uh, all the protocols started with the blood cultures and they came out negative. But we were convinced that it was infective endocarditis by the look of the patient. So we went for echo and there was the vegetation. And uh, we also followed the Duke criteria. So one major criteria was fulfilled. That was the vegetation on the echo. And secondly, we had the embolic phenomena and pyrexia. Along with that, uh, during the course of the hospital, this patient urine routine at the, uh, initially was normal except for mild proteinuria, but he developed proteinuria uh, more and uh, blood in the urine and granular cast. So he developed glomerulonephritis also along the course of the hospital. And three minor criteria were also fulfilled. So we could uh, totally diagnose him as infective endocarditis. And uh, we also believe that the patient might have uh, antibiotics in the last 15 days because of his, uh, his dengue condition. We don't treat dengue with antibiotics, but he might have taken self-medicated that uh, himself or the, maybe the, in the previous course of the hospital when he was not diagnosed, he could have administered. We believe that cultures would also have been po positive in this case. And this patient was managed medically and was started on broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, meropenem and targosid which were to be continued for uh, six weeks. And the pericardial effusion, since it was large, uh, for that pericardiosynthesis was done and the drain was kept in situ for five days. And uh, after that, we removed it when uh, the echo showed, repeat echo showed resolving pericardial effusion. And uh, after uh, he had a long course in the hospital around for one month. And uh, the uh, repeat echo after that showed resolving vegetations as well. With the, uh, with the treatment we gave. And uh, uh, slowly and gradually, his mental status also improved and he was hemodynamically stable. The best part of it was the patient came out of it alive and was seen on follow-up and he completed his course of uh, a, six, a six weeks course of antibiotics and is doing fine now. And his spleen has also returned to normal size because of the antibiotics only that we started. And uh, currently, he's seen on follow-up and is doing amazing. And well, I I, uh, I so appreciate the like, what Maria said about you smiling constantly. I think you have such a palpable enthusiasm for medicine and a love to learn and teach. And I think it just shines through here. This is um, an incredibly educational case that takes something that is very common, endocarditis, and camouflages it so deeply. 
It's camouflaged in negative blood cultures. It's camouflaged as an acute stroke syndrome with encephalopathy mimicking a hemorrhage. It's camouflaged in uh, the notion that the spleen is big and it's infarcted, making us think, is there something chronic like TB happening? It's camouflaged in so many ways, but it actually is a very common condition, probably uh, now with the response to regular antibiotics, you've proven that this is regular bacterial endocarditis. This is not some cancer or an esoteric organism that's getting better on routine antibiotics. So you've proven that this is either strep, staph, or, um, uh, or some gram negatives. But I will share the final connection, which is that in patients who recover from dengue or who are in the recovery phase, they are at high risk of two things hemophagocytic syndrome, which was mentioned earlier by the chat, and bacterial superinfection. It's a reminder that dengue actually suppresses our immune system temporarily for two to three weeks after. And I suspect that that's the vulnerability that took this patient to where he got here. But um, absolutely amazing case. Maria, it was such a pleasure to discuss it with you. I think um, I'm glad like I said at the beginning, I'm glad that Anmol brought you a little bit of neurology, but also stretched both of us. This case is undiagnosable um, and is only diagnosed when the patient gets better with presumed treatment. And so I hope you enjoyed the journey. Uh, I certainly did. What feelings are you left with at the end? I'm so thankful for antibiotics. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Oh, I think, um, I'm not sure if it's me. Yeah, I can see uh, you guys moving. I think uh, Maria froze, unfortunately. <laughs> well, <anim> <laughs> Maria's thankful antibiotics is a, is a big takeaway. Um, at the end of this session, I'm thrilled to actually tell you um, that one of our newest uh, CP Solvers team members. Um, oh, there you are. Oh, I think you you uh, phased out. What were you going to say? I am so sorry. Um no, but I was just saying how thankful I am to be here and to share this case with you, Rami and Molo. It was a fantastic case. And um, yeah, it's made my day, my whole week. So it's cool. Uh, to top it off, uh, Maria, not only are we grateful for Anmol and you, uh, our newest uh, CP Solvers team member, Navreed, has been working ferociously at the teaching points. Um, I'm really, really excited to hear them. I'll probably have to listen to them on YouTube because I'm a little late to uh, my uh, my shift. So Maria, I made you the host. And so if we have insight into your clinic day, that's because you didn't end the meeting like I did on Friday. <laughs> so go ahead. Um, uh, Nafrit, the mic is yours and I look forward to listening to your wisdom uh, on YouTube. Yeah. Bye guys. So yeah, uh, thank you for this interesting case. Uh, so for any neuro case, first thing is we have to man maintain the airway breathing and circulation. And if a patient is presenting with one side of neuro symptom, we always think of any vascular cause. And if a patient is presenting with fever and neurological symptoms, then it means that there is some inflammatory cause, like some infection or meningitis. For a neural case, a review of system and risk factors is very important because they can actually point out some really important information. A patient who is presenting with weakness, we always approach to know the location of the weakness. We start from the cortex to internal capsule to lower medulla to spinal cord and to the heart and muscle fiber to know the exact location. Uh, another important thing that we learned during this case is that the dengue can have very can have very variable presentation. It can can only present with just fever to hemorrhagic shock. So or for any patient who have dengue fever, try to ask the detailed history and the presentation. Another thing, uh, arbovirus infection can always, can sometimes coexist with tick infection and tick infection can also cause paralysis. So have that thing in the mind. For hyperacute uh, symptoms for any neurological case, it, it, it could be a sign of any vascular sign or any embolism. And if there's a hyperacute symptom and if they are presenting with the signs of encephalopathy, that lean more towards the hemorrhage, hemorrhagic cause than the ischemic cause. Uh, another thing that we need to know for any neurological patient is that we need to know the previous normal baseline presentation, their normal glucose, their normal blood, blood glucose, and the CT scan. Uh, neurological patients are, are high risk for the herniation, so we need to keep an eye on the patient's vital and examination uh, on the eye examination. Uh, we need to keep an eye on the neck rigidity to look for any chronic signs of meningitis, or if because the patient was a known case of dengue, to know for any pulmonary edema. And and if 
looking always need to be have an aggressive approach for any big uh, brain infection otherwise it's proven otherwise because brain infection are serious and for any brain infection uh, blood culture 50 percent predictive and we need to start the patient on empiric antibiotics and uh, steroids and we de do need to do a CT scan of the head of the patient if the patient age is more than 60 if patient have any history of any seizures any focal lesions any history of any aids or altered mental status uh, there's a very important point that we know through this case is that the source of infection can be in four different parts of the brain. It could be in the parenchyma, could be in uh, abscess or diffuse encephalopathy. It could be in ventricles. It could be in the vessels, endocarditis, or in the meninges. And another important thing is that a patient who have infection in the meninges, it can spread to the vessels and can cause stroke which is a very common presentation in the patient suffering from uh, tuberculosis meningitis or fungal meningitis. Uh, we always try to know the source of the thrombus and the nature of the thrombus. The thrombus can be a clot, can be a pus, could be a cancer or cholesterol. And another thing, very important point is that we need to know the uh, if the patient is having multiple simultaneous thrombus, there are two conditions that can lead to. Either the thrombus is centrally located like in our patient, could be in the aortic valve in the heart, or it could be because of a bad, severely bad condition that is spreading the clot like vasculitis, vasculopathy, or hypercoagulable state. Uh, Exudative pleural effusion, pericardial effusion can be because of a malignancy or could be because of a bacterial infection or could be a fungus infection. And, and as in our patient, most common presentation for the culture negative results is that patient got antibiotics prior to the blood drawn for the culture. And last point is that dengue can have a uh, dengue infection can present with uh, because it's an immunocompromised state, patient can present with bacterial super infection, or dengue can in itself can present as a hemorrhagic fever. That's all for the teaching point. Thank you, guys. Boom! Awesome teaching points, I'm free. Thank you so much to cap for capturing what a complex case. And then, well, also, thank you again so much for bringing the case. It was uh, it was great to spend this hour with all of you. Have a great day. Uh, you too. Bye.